Hello, my name is Emily Russell, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at ISM at Brown University. Today I want to talk about a beautiful intersection between mathematics and music in the form of English change ringing. This is a Bellarian tradition which is very deeply rooted in the mathematics of group theory, um, and in fact there are mathematical theorems which have been proven which are very much drawn out of bell ringing, um, and so the connection really goes both ways. So today I'll talk a little bit about what change ringing is in the first place, um, and how it connects to the mathematics of group theory. <laughs> The change ringing tradition started in about the early 1600s in England, um, and it's a little bit different from what many people think of uh, when they might think of bells. You might be more familiar with bells ringing hymns or tunes coming out of a carillon or out of a chime. Um, in that case, if you imagine that this is a tower bell, uh, so it's maybe you know, a ton large, in that case a stationary bell is hit by a hammer, which makes it sound. In change ringing, on the other hand, uh, this is actually very different we do what we call full circle ringing. So imagine again that this is a bell in a tower and it's mounted on a giant wooden wheel. Uh, that wooden wheel actually allows it to ring from mouth upward a full 360 degrees to mouth upward again and then back. Um, and there's a metal clapper inside the bell which swings with it and this rings about three quarters of the way through that swing when the bell is facing outward. This allows the sound to carry a greater distance um, but it also basically gives us mechanical limitations to what we can do with these bells. Because of that full period swing, the bell wants to ring approximately once every two seconds. And that means that we can't really ring tunes on change ringing bells. Uh, basically, the time between the time you, you can get the bell to ring once and ring, ring again is just too large. So instead of ringing tunes, we end up ringing these slightly differently. We actually have quite a lot of control within a narrow window around that two seconds. We can speed the bell up a little bit or slow it down a little bit. Um, again, within a window near two seconds, but we can quite precisely con control when the bell actually rings. And so what we can do is if we have two bells ringing one after another, one, two, one, two, we can slow down bell one slightly and at the same time speed up bell two slightly so that they swap places and ring in a different order the next time, two, one. And this gives us basically the basic, um, the basic piece of change ringing, which is called a plane change. Uh, so in about the six, around 1610 or so, uh, the art of change ringing came about using these plane changes. And I'll show you what a plane change looks like, for example, on four bells in this case. So if we take four bells, we're going to label them in order, one, two, three, four, from the highest pitch down to the lowest pitch. Um, so a plane change, we have three different options of what we can do. We can swap the first two bells, in which case we end up with the order 2, 1, 3, 4. We can swap the middle two bells, and we get the order 1, 3, 2, 4. Or we could swap the last two bells, and we get the order 1, 2, 4, 3. So each of these is a plane change, starting from that one, two, three, four order. Now this one, two, three, four order actually has a special name in change ringing. We use it so much uh, that we've given it a title and we call it rounds. So we'll come back to that. But whenever I say rounds, I mean this one, two, three, four order, this descending pitch from highest pitch to lowest pitch. Um, so you can see that instead of ringing tunes on these bells, we're actually ringing different orders of the bells. Uh, we ring the bells in some order, then we make a plane change and ring the bells in a new order or a new permutation. Uh, so this is essentially where the link to group theory comes in. This is an example of a mathematical structure called a group. The permutation group is one specific example. There are also many other types of groups. But the permutation group is a particularly interesting one uh, that both change ringers and mathematicians use quite often um, and do quite a lot of work with. So we'll start talking about some of the group theory ideas um, that we're going to use. And the first of those is this idea of a permutation group. Now, there are actually uh, four factorial, or about 20, or exactly 24 different permutations on four bells, right? So I've only shown you four of them so far. Um, this rounds that we started from and these three that we can get to by using plane changes. Can we use plane changes to get to all the other permutations? Can we get all 24 permutations using these plane changes? Um, the answer turns out to be yes, we can. Um, the change ringers figured this out again back in the early 1600s. Um, and they use a particular, a particular algorithm was developed to allow you to get to all 24 permutations um, through a specific set of steps, a sequence of steps. 
Um, this same algorithm was essentially written down and published by mathematicians in about the 1960s. It's referred to as the Steinhaus Johnson Trotter algorithm in mathematics. Um, and you can see on the slides an example of how it works. Essentially, I'm not going to go through the full details, but we're taking Bell 4, we're making swaps to march it from this end of the change down to the front of the change and then back again, occasionally swapping some of the other bells that we get to every order. And so these 24 permutations is exactly one copy of each of the possible 24 permutations on four bells. Now I want you to notice two particular things about this sequence. First of all, if you look at that last change uh, at row 24, 2, 1, 3, 4, you'll see that if we make one more plane change, we get back to 1, 2, 3, 4, we get back to rounds. So this cycle essentially closes in on itself. Uh, this sequence is actually a closed loop, beginning in rounds and then ending again in rounds. And this is actually a feature that change ringers really aim for. Uh, this is something that we have as a goal whenever we're writing a performance or a composition of changes that, that we're going to, to ring. We want to begin and end in rounds. The other thing to notice is that there are no repetitions. We hit every permutation once and only once. Uh, we don't ring any of them twice other than beginning and ending in the same place in rounds. Um, and this is also a goal of change ringing, to ring as many permutations as we can, in some cases all of them, without repeating any. So there are two terms uh, that we use for this in change ringing. We say an extent uh, is a performance which includes all permutations. And we say a performance is true if it has no repeats. Now it turns out that there's a group theoretical uh, concept which is very much the same as these concepts that we're going for in change ringing, and that's called a Hamiltonian cycle. So in a Hamiltonian cycle, it's exactly a path through every member of a group, hitting each one exactly once and beginning and ending in the same place, in our case in rounds. So a Hamilt Hamiltonian cycle in group theory is a true extent in change ringing. We can use these plane changes to get all of these possible permutations using this algorithm. But let's move on from plane changes uh, to something which is a little bit more beautiful and a little bit more fun and interesting from a change ringing point of view. Instead of swapping only one pair of bells at a time, we're now going to allow multiple swaps simultaneously. So for four bells, there's only one way we can do this. We can swap the first two bells with each other, and at the same time we swap the last two bells with one another. And so we end up with the order 2, 1, 4, 3. This is called a cross change. And it basically allows us to go through uh, the permutations in different orders and in different combinations. So if we do this cross change, you see we get 2, 1, 4, 3. Um, if we were to do another cross change, then we would just get right back where we started again, right? Again, our goal is to not have repeats, is to ring as many permutations as we can without repeating. So instead of doing another cross change, we'll put in a plane change. We'll do a change which is swapping the middle two bells, um, and so we get to the order 2, 4, 1, 3. Now we can repeat that sort of sequence, cross change, a plane change, a cross change, a plane change. And after eight of these changes, we get back to rounds again. Uh, but you see we've, we've hit things in a different order than we did uh, the first time we went through all these permutations. Now this is a very common pattern in change ringing. It's called plane hunt. Um, and it appears as pieces of many other different patterns that we ring as well. Um, and so since this is the first piece of uh, sort of modern change ringing that we've talked about, we're actually going to demonstrate this for you. Uh, we're going to let you hear plane hunt as it sounds on bells. So we have here hand bells. Um, and my fellow mathematician and bell ringer, Dale Winter, is going to join me to give this demonstration. We're each ringing two bells, one in each hand. Uh, this is the highest bell. Uh, down to Dale is holding the lowest bell. And we're going to ring for you um, exactly those changes that you can see on the slide in that order. Uh, we'll actually ring the first one rounds twice over. This is just a matter of convention in change ringing. And then we'll start swapping the order of the bells. So here we go. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay. 
the changes that we rang actually have a special name in group theory. They're known as the dihedral group on four elements. So these actually correspond to the plane lead that we just rang. Now, the dihedral group is, in group theory, much more often described as the set of symmetries of a square. That is, the, way we can, the ways in which we can rotate or reflect a square and get back a square that looks very much the same. And there's actually a nice parallel uh, between the dihedral group um, thought of as the symmetries of a square and the plane lead, those changes that we just rang for you uh, from the plane hunt. So let me try to show you how that works. I'm going to draw here a square, and I'm going to label its corners. One, two, three, four. Now this is a slightly odd order, perhaps, uh, but you'll see how this order works out in a minute. Now, I can draw a line here, and I can reflect the square around that line and get a new square with a new labeling. So if I do that reflection, then what I end up with is two, one, four, three, which is exactly the order that we got by doing this cross change starting from one, two, three, four. There's another line I can reflect around. I can also reflect around this diagonal line. And if I do that diagonal reflection, then the square I end up with looks like this. One, three, two, four. And that is exactly one of the sequences that we got from doing this middle swap, again, from one, two, three, four. Um, so this is the cross change. And this is the plane change. Uh, in group theory, uh, looking at these symmetries, often this is discussed instead in terms of a rotation of the square rather than these reflections. So if you rotate the square by 90 degrees, what do you end up with? You end up with 2, 4, 1, 3 which is actually the third change that we rang when we rang you plain hunt. Um, we actually rang the sequence first, one, two, three, four, then two, one, four, three, and then two, four, one, three. And there are other ways you can rotate the square, 90 degrees the other way, uh, or by 180 degrees, and these give those other sequences that we rang in plain hunt. Um, so really there is a perfect correspondence between the changes in plain hunt and these reflections and rotations of this square. Um, and this is true actually for different numbers of bells. You can also extend plain hunt to ring on five bells, on six bells, on any number of bells, and it will all come back to reflections very much of this type on polygons with different numbers of sides. So if you take a hexagon and look at the symmetries of the hexagon, that will be the same essentially as plain hunt on six bells instead. Now by ringing plain hunt, we have this very nice group structure, um, but we only got eight different changes, eight different permutations out of the possible 24. Is there some way we can get back the other 16 that we're missing. And so what we're going to do is at the very end there, instead of swapping the middle two bells and coming back to rounds, we're going to make a slight change. We're going to swap instead the last two bells, the two and the four, and so we get a new permutation that we haven't rung before, one, three, four, two. Now we can keep going. We repeat this entire pattern two more times, and after a total of three times through that pattern, then after 24 changes, we end up back at rounds again. So we've essentially extended plain hunt um, in order to get another Hamiltonian cycle, another example where we start and end in rounds, we get every permutation, and we don't repeat anything. This is known as plain bob minimus, minimus meaning it's on four bells. Um, and this is, again, one of the very common patterns that we use in change ringing. So let us perform for you plain bob minimus, again on our handbells, um, so you can hear how it sounds. We'll ring the bells just a little bit faster this time, so it may be a little bit harder to keep track of what's going on, but we're ringing exactly those changes in that order. Again, we'll ring rounds twice before we start, and then we'll start swapping the order of the bells. Here we go.
I told you this was a Hamiltonian cycle. I told you that we didn't repeat any changes. Now, with only 24 permutations to look at, it's pretty easy just to check that explicitly, to look at every change and compare it to every other and realize that we didn't repeat anything. But on more bells with more possible permutations, there can be thousands of different changes that we ring in a composition. And you don't want to have to check every single one line by line. So the chain trainers came up with some tricks uh, in order to make it easier to check whether a composition was true, whether or not there were any repeats in a composition. And this hinges on essentially some group theory properties of the changes that we're ringing. If you look at these columns as I've written them out, um, you'll see a few things. First of all, the relationship between uh, the rows in each column is the same from column to column. We use the same sequence of swaps to go from, for example, the first change to the fifth change as we do from the ninth to the thirteenth. And so if you look at those two pairs, one and five are the reverse of each other, nine and thirteen are also the reverse of each other. And that's true for any pair within a column that you choose. Um, so using that property, we then also notice, remember, that the first column is a group, is a subgroup within the group of all permutations. And so that means that essentially um, each column is going to have different changes in it as long as we use those same swaps. And so that means that once we know the first column, we can look at the second column. We compare only the top row of that second column to the first column. And as long as that top row is not a repeat of anything we've already rung, the entire column is safe. None of those changes are repeats. In the same way, in the third column, as long as that top change doesn't appear in either the first or second columns, the entire column is safe. There are no repeats there. And this idea, um, essentially, is very related to the group theory concept of cosets. The columns, uh, as I've displayed it for plain Bob Minimus, are actually cosets of the dihedral group of that first column. And the idea that the cosets are the same length and contain different changes essentially uh, very much relates to the proof of Lagrange's theorem, written by the famous mathematician Lagrange in 1771 and then proven by others over the course of the 1800s. Um, so cosets turn out to be very important in essentially proving truth in these change ringing compositions. Um, so in the end, uh, mathematics and change ringing have a lot to do with each other. Uh, the relationship goes both ways. Mathematicians use group theory and also develop group theory. Um, in both cases, I've, I've really only touched on the very basics. Um, I've mentioned a few basic concepts in group theory and a few of the basics of change ringing. If you want to learn more, uh, there are some resources you can look at. I drew heavily from a series of papers by Arthur T. White on mathematics and change ringing. Uh, and these last two papers uh, reference a mathematical theorem, which was proven based on bell ringing ideas. Um, but in the end, both of them are really beautiful fields, uh, both group theory and change ringing, in which there's just an enormous amount to learn. You can always keep learning both in mathematics and in music. Thank you.